The current manner in which activism is done does not aid in conservation efforts, but in fact impedes development of sustainable systems. Now hold on, eager activists. I'm not some climate change denying politician here to ruin your day. I'm simply performing a little thought experiment. Let's start with this. This conference was built upon the ideas of critical thinking communities, or CTCs. What are CTCs? Well, instead of giving a long-winded definition, how about I show you? One of the base skills of critical thought is analysis of one's own thinking patterns. So let's do just that. Let's think about how we think. Odd, yes, but this is a critical aspect of higher order thinking, so bear with me for a moment. I'm sure you remember the statement made earlier, right? Now I'm sure you've got an opinion already primed since the moment you heard it. Assessing and interpreting information as quickly as possible is a vital skill, and your personal lens is the only window you have to frame the world, so obviously it's going to be used. However, if we don't take a moment every now and then to stop and reassess the woodwork of those frames, we can rush forward with incomplete ideas. So, how do we assess that frame? Take a moment to look back at how you think. Remove yourself from your own skin and don't be afraid to give yourself a thorough criticism. Why did you respond to the statement how you did? If it made you angry, are you angry because you found a fallacy in that statement? Or because you've unconsciously found a fallacy in yourself? Are you uncomfortable yet? Good. Finding and acknowledging the flaws in our own ways of thinking, as uncomfortable as it may be, gives us the opportunity to buff them out and refine our lens. Christopher Hitchens said it best, the essence of the independent mind lies not in what it thinks, but in how it thinks. So hopefully I've properly introduced the concept behind this event. This is not about how to cope with industries turning our green into their gold, nor arguing over lawmakers with Ben Franklin stuffed in their ears. This is about us, our lives, our lifestyles, and our own thoughts. Bring your own brain. Hello everyone, um, my name is Everett and this is Bree. Um, welcome to Bring Your Own Brain, a symposium to free us from climate chaos. We'll be your MCs today uh, for the rest of for this week. Um, so first some logistical things, if you guys need to go to the bathroom, um, there are two bathrooms out in the hallway on either side in front of the, um, the table out there. Um, if you want food, coffee, there, the UC Center is is open, and also if you parked um, if you parked in the Adam Center parking lot, you cannot park on the road. You'll get a ticket. You have to actually park in the lot. So, just some logistical things. All right, um, and now we would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Samantha Mathis, a member of Freedom from Climate Chaos, to introduce our first speaker. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to bring bring your own brain. To start off the symposium, Dr. Stephen Running will talk to us about the science of climate change. There will be a Q&A period after Dr. Running is done speaking, so please be thinking of questions to ask. Dr. Running is a Regents Professor of Forest Ecology in the College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana and has been with the university since 1979. His primary research interest is the development of global and regional ecosystem biogeochemical models integrating remote sensing with bioclimatology and terrestrial ecology. He is a team member for the NASA Earth Observing System, Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer, and he is responsible for the EOS Global Terrestrial Net Primary Production and Evo Evaporation Transpiration Datasets. He has published over 260 scientific articles and two books. In 2007, Dr. Running shared the Nobel Peace Prize as a chapter lead author for the fourth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Running is an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union and is designated a highly cited researcher by the Institute for Scientific Information. In the popular press, his essay in 2007, The Five Stages of Climate Grief, has been widely quoted. Throughout his presentation, please be thinking of some questions that you would like to ask Mr. Running. 
There will be time for questions towards the end. Please help me with welcoming Dr. Stephen Running. Mm, do I? I don't think I need that. Okay. Yeah. So that do you? All right. Are we ready to roll? I'm. I'm not sure who who uh, came up with this clever title using my name, running through the science of climate change. I didn't come up with it, but I, I might use it again sometime. Um, as I got ready for this talk, I scanned some of my previous uh, lectures, and particularly one in 2007. Uh, I said, what is needed now? And think of this. This is a decade ago. What is needed now in America? Courageous political leadership that will be honest about climate change, energy, and solutions. <sighs> and of course, we see what kind of courageous leadership we have that just uh, without knowing anything about the topic or caring about the topic, uh, pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord just a week or two ago. And so that's how well we've done in the last decade on political leadership. And so you said on your website, the adults have failed. And I'd have to say in fair measure, I'd have to agree with you that in, in particularly in political leadership, I think your uh, indictment of my generation is, is pretty accurate, I'm sorry to say, is that we have not um, gotten at all the political leadership that we need for my generation. And so I think what you're doing this week is the perfect thing that uh, students your age should be doing, is saying, all right, we can't wait around for the adult. I hate to call myself an adult, but I guess I have to. Um, no use waiting for my generation to do anything any longer. You really have to take control. And I hope uh, with this uh, first uh, lecture of the week, I can tell you first uh, the basis of climate change as we know it today, but also be tickling you with what I see as interesting new developments on the solution pathway. Now, there's new things coming up every day every week. In a lot of ways, our private sector is doing much better than our government leadership is. And it will, we'll look at that. And particularly for um, students, I'm going to try to point out some, well, I think that it'll be self-evident, but I'll also try to point out that if I was in your shoes getting ready to go to college, what would I start to be made, thinking about majoring in? And you might be uh, surprised that I really won't suggest climate scientists all that much. Now, we need a few, but we certainly uh, need a lot of other uh, disciplines to engage in this topic, and I'm going to spend some time on that. So let's get going. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is when I was in college and in graduate school, and I worked on uh, esoteric details about how trees endure water stress in the summer. I never imagined that I would ever give public talks. I never imagined that the press would ever interview me. I'd never imagined that I'd be quoted in the New York Times. You know, none of that seemed like it was in the cards one bit. I was going to be this uh, kind of conehead scientist and uh, or just writing papers in my lab. And yet, I think your generation, all of you, whatever discipline you end up working in, you're going to have to be ready for public speaking, for writing and expressing your, yourself, your ideas, for uh, admonishing and encouraging your, your generation of what needs to be done. You're going to need to lead in a very tangible way that I didn't think about when I was in graduate school, and I hope you all will. All right, well, let's get down to some of the, some of the climate science. And I always find this is the first 
important concept to get in everybody's mind. That weather is what we see day to day um, in, in just our local environment. So it's going to be 70 degrees here in Missoula today and that does, doesn't sound like global warming, does it? It's just a normal, uh, normal day in the early, early summer. But you don't want to confuse that with what we mean by climate. When, we, when we're talking about climate, we're talking about trends over decades. And any given day, I mean, if, if, it was, if it snowed today, that would not prove global cooling. Or if it was 100 degrees today, it wouldn't prove global warming. That's one day in one little place on Earth. When we talk about global climate change, remember the word global, and remember that climate means multiple decade trends. The second thing I've found really helps people understand the, the conceptual basis of, of this whole issue is uh, you might say some proportionality of the climate system. And this slide comes from the International Space Station, and I like to use it because uh, uh, I hope you can see that this is the whole west coast, Pacific Northwest. We're right about to the edge here. Um, so we're seeing thousands and thousands, actually millions of square miles of land area there. But what I want you to look at is the tiny little film on the, what we call the limb of the Earth. That's the atmosphere. The atmosphere is only about 10 miles thick. So what's 10 miles? 10 miles is here to Lolo or here to Frenchtown. It's nothing. And yet that is the sum thickness of the atmosphere. So you have millions of square miles of land area, tens of millions of square miles, and yet you have an atmosphere that's only 10 miles thick. The minute you understand that proportionality, it becomes logical that, yes, we could fill up that tiny little ribbon of atmosphere with pollutants, because that's what this is all about. And um, Dave Keeling started the famous Keeling curve of atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa in 1958. There it is. There he is riding up the snowball chairlift with me years ago. Um, and what he illustrated, quite simply, is, yep, CO2 is going up in the atmosphere. And it's gone up every single year since the measurement started. And we're now, this was as of a week ago, we're now at about 409 parts per million. Um, we started down at about 320 parts per million when I was born. And so just in my lifetime, it's gone from something on the order of 320 to 410. And so we now take these measurements all over the world. This is absolutely airtight. No, no climate denier can deny that CO2 is not going up in the atmosphere. Of course, it is worth asking, why should we care? And so what's so magic about CO2? And you probably have got this in your science classes before, that CO2 is what we call a greenhouse gas. And simply stated, a greenhouse gas is a molecule that has the, the molecular structure that allows shortwave visible light to go through the atmosphere, but it tends to trap longwave thermal energy that's radiating back out. And um, this is not some wild new theory. Svante Arrhenius got a Nobel Prize in 1896 by, and figured out that um, uh, soci industrial society was just starting to burn uh, coal and hadn't really got onto oil yet, so was burning coal. And he just kind of matter-of-factly thought, gee, if we keep burning coal, CO2 will build up in the atmosphere, and someday I'll bet the, the climate will start to warm up. And so he just intuitively figured this out 100 years ago. This is not new theory. Very well established. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that I was an author 
in the fourth assessment in 2007. These things are about 2,000 pages long. And um, probably none of you are going to read it, so I'm going to save you the effort. This is the best one-page summary of those 2,000 pages. And what it does is shows us how scientists put together the energy budget of the Earth system. And so we look, and these are measurements. These are not computer models. These are measurements of all different factors that control the Earth's energy balance and, and the climate system. And uh, I like to start from the bottom, the small things, and work up. Um, you can see anything in blue cools the climate, and anything in red warms it. Uh, way down here, changing energy from the sun. Some people think, well, maybe the sun's getting brighter, and it's warming up, so there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, that isn't the slightest bit true. We have satellites that have been measuring that for decades, and this is how much conceivable warming changing solar energy provides. We look at cloud cover, changes in cloud cover, changes in aerosols. Aerosols actually cool the climate. One of the problems with uh, the Asian brown cloud, as they call the air pollutants over Asia, uh, the aerosols are so thick that it actually, in a local sense, cools that area. In a global sense, it provides a bit of a cooling force. Um, we look at things like changes in land cover, changes in snow cover. And I recognize this is measurements taken all around the globe. What's the change in snow cover worldwide? Well, we have an answer for that. We finally look at these greenhouse gases. And those are on top because they're the biggest signal. And uh, carbon dioxide and methane are by far the biggest and most important of these gases. Now you add and subtract all of these, and you come down to a final number of 2.3 watts per square meter. Now probably none of us can really relate to 2.3 watts per square meter very easily, but think of it this way. Think of the little old time incandescent Christmas tree lights, and think this table is about a square meter. So imagine a Christmas tree light on this table, and on this one, and on this square meter, and on this square meter, all around the world, one more little Christmas tree light of additional energy. Additional energy is being trapped. That's the greenhouse effect right there. The next question we ask is, OK, if this has been going on, uh, Where's all this energy going? And I find this graph to be incredibly important for a number of reasons. And the first thing you see at first glance is what we know is it's almost all going into the ocean. 95% of this additional heat is going into the ocean. Notice the atmosphere and land are just a tiny sliver here. The atmosphere delivers to us the day-to-day -day weather. But it's the ocean that generates the decadal climate trends. The other thing I find valuable with this graph is to uh, look at when things really started. Turns out it was right about the time I got here, 1979. I don't think there's any cause effect coupling of those two uh, facts. But I started here in about 1980. And that has an important message for us. Global warming has been going on for about 40 years now. So this isn't just starting. We are well into it, and this uh, clearly illustrates that. that this is um, a condition of the Earth system that's uh, well underway, and there's no use, in, in, as a climate scientist, there's no use arguing about those basic climate facts. They're just, there's the data. Uh, by far our most valuable time should be spent talking about what to do. And I hope to get to that here pretty quick. I want to touch about on a couple of the impacts that you may not be very aware of that we think are some of the most important and fundamental impacts worldwide. 
And um, here in Montana, we don't think about the ocean too much, but I figured I better start with uh, some ocean information. What we're most concerned with in the oceans is not actually the, wa the water temperature. It's the acidification of the ocean. When you're increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, some of that CO2 dissolves down into the water, ba just basic diffusion chemistry. What that does is produce carbonic acid in the water. So what's going on is the ocean is acidifying. And, and what makes that particularly unnerving is all the shellfish, corals, shrimp, clams, um, uh, sea life like that, they build their shells with calcium carbonate, which is highly sensitive to the acidity of the ocean. And so some of the ocean scientists are theorizing that some of our, our, uh, our, ocean, our ocean life will not be able to build a shell in the future because the acidity of the ocean will have changed. And they see that as more important than the ocean temperature itself. So in ocean biology, uh, acidification is the big issue. I come from Seattle and they're already quite concerned about the oyster beds and the clam beds in Puget Sound. The other ocean issue that you've probably heard some in the news is sea level rise. And this is actually a picture from Miami only a few months ago and this isn't even a storm. This is a normal high tide nowadays and high tides are now uh, washing into the streets of Miami. And if, if this is what happens on a normal high tide, imagine what happens when you have a hurricane or a big storm and a high tide on top of it. And so uh, uh, climate scientists basically feel the single most destructive part of global warming, the single biggest factor, will be sea level rise for human disruption, let's call it. The single biggest thing. Because you think how many of our biggest cities are all around coastlines. And Miami's just an example. Think of New York City with Hurricane Sandy. And then think of all the major cities around the world. Uh, we're um, increasing sea level at about 3.4 millimeters a year. And we measure that by satellite with very high accuracy. This inset is that sea level rise since I think it's 1990 or something like that. This is about 20 years of record. And so we have satellite data collecting this all the time. So we know very well what's happening to sea level rise. Luckily for Montana, that's one of the things we don't have to deal with. Probably the most visible early Earth system impact of, of global warming and I say early impact, I mean we started seeing the trends back in the 80s and 90s, 20, 30 years ago, was a shrinking ice cap. Even our earliest satellites, which the, the, the camera on your cell phone is a hundred times better than the cameras on these earlier satellites. It's hard for you all to imagine how primitive these early satellites were, but they could see white from dark really well. And so they were able to start tracking the Arctic ice cap from back in the early 80s because it was so easy to see the white ice and the black, uh, uh, the black ocean. Well, what we know is 40% of the Arctic ice cap is now melted away. And um, we follow that, again, with satellites, very high accuracy every week, every week of the year. You see the outline of in the late 70s where that Arctic ice cap was, and now you see where it is now. They're beginning to plan summertime ocean shipping going up over the top to the Arctic Ocean, particularly big container ships coming from Asia uh, to Europe. They won't bother with this uh, Panama Canal anymore. They'll go right over the top and save a, a couple of thousand miles worth of distance. Um, not to mention the queue at the Panama Canal. And so uh, this, uh, 
about every five years they update their estimate of when they expect the North Pole to come ice free. And now they figure it could be within 10, 10 years or so. That some summer the Arctic ice cap will just finally go poof and the North Pole will be open ocean. Now we follow the Antarctica equally. And in Antarctica it's quite a different situation. You have a continent at the pole rather than an ocean. And so it turns out that changes a lot of the dynamics. At the South Pole, oh, I should remember these better. If I remember right, the elevation of the South Pole is something like 10,000 feet. And the hottest air temperature, hottest ever recorded is something like four below zero. And so the middle of the Antarctic continent is not going anywhere anytime soon. But what happens in, in Antarctica is all these edges uh, that have all these glaciers coming down to the ocean. And those are accelerating um, in their melt off. In fact, I read last night there's a big ice chunk, I think, I think at the end here, the, the, the size of the island is Cyprus that they figure will break off within, within a month and it'll be the biz, biggest iceberg ever seen. And that's just imminently ready to, to pop off. Now, of course, when it, when it comes to retreating ice, we have our own icon. It's amazing when I travel worldwide and I introduce myself from Montana, how many people say, that's where Glacier National Park is. Is it true the glaciers are almost gone? People know about that all around the world, even ones that have never been here and never will be here. That is an iconic image in people's mind, a park named for glaciers where the glaciers are almost gone. And my friend Dan Fagery takes those, that data and he says within about a decade there'll really be no definable glaciers. There'll still be snow fields that last through the summer, but you have to be moving to be a glacier. And he says that the actual moving glaciers will be gone in about a decade. And so we put all this together and it's quite clear that uh, again since around 1980, some uh, even suggest earlier, we've been on a warming trend in global annual air temperature. And uh, the you might have seen in the press that the last three years in a row we've set successive all-time records for global air temperature. And so we are on a continuing traje trajectory up in air temperature. And this is, uh, again, not computer models. This is simply weather stations like our Missoula Airport uh, reporting in to WMO in G Geneva, the World Meteorological Organization, every day. So this is simply uh, weather station data accumulated for the world. Now. Some of my colleagues here in the Montana Climate Center just finished a new analysis of Montana climate trends. And so I've got a few slides here that are actually less than a month old, and this is one of them. This is the degrees per decade increase. Notice around the whole state, we're averaging something around 0.4 degrees per decade, or about 4 degrees Fahrenheit per century which is about what the theory says that we would be uh, increasing. Uh, notice this is from 1950 to the present. So over that period, we've been uh, going, warming at about that rate. And again, this is simply weather station records. Now it's useful to think through these, these temperature trends, because a couple of degrees doesn't sound like much. And you look at a day like today and you think, gee, there's nothing particularly abnormal about this day. I don't get it. And so these graphics we built for the 2007 IPCC report, and I think they help a lot in thinking through what these temperature shifts mean. So let's say we went out to Missoula Airport and we got all the temperature data for the year and just plotted it up. 
and the highest temperature for the year would be way out here. The lowest temperature would be uh, on the other side. And then there'd be what the statisticians like to call a, generally a normal distribution of temperatures through the year. The average for the year and then these deviations on both sides. Now what's going on with global warming is that's shifting. That whole distribution is shifting. And the minute you look at that graph, there's a couple of things that are helpful for us to understand. First is that in the middle here, there's a lot of days that are pretty much the same, just like today. 70 degrees for mid-June is a pretty normal temperature. But the next thing you recognize is it looks like the real action is way out here on the edges. Are there more high temperatures, extreme high temperatures? Are there less extreme low temperatures? Well, we asked that question and we got a decade of Missoula weather station data and found out. So what we did is took the decade of the 1950s, 1950 to 1960, and then we took 2000 to 2010. And we plotted it just the way that conceptual graph showed and just to see what happens. And um, this is our normal distribution. Uh, I got a C in statistics in college. And so to me, this is good enough. Um, I wasn't any big statistical wizard. And, uh, and so it appears that the two decades aren't particularly different and that you've got the kind of distribution plan. Let's zoom in on those edges, though. Let's look at the high temperatures first. You know, in the 1950s, it only went above 100, something like twice in the entire decade in Missoula. And in the 2000s, the, you know, we're really looking at the area under these two curves. In the 2000s, we not only had a number of more uh, temperatures above 100. In July 2007, we had 12 days over 100 in one month. So that was more than the whole decade of the 1950s combined. And so we see that the particularly the number of days above 95 degrees here in Missoula has probably gone up by a factor of five or more. I mean, this is the kind of thing you could do yourself with any weather station data set if you're curious. Uh, you ought to dig up your hometown weather statistics and see what's happened. It's easy to do. Now let's look at the other side, the cold temperatures. And of course, this is where you want to ask your grandparents how tough it was when they were kids, because they love to tell you. And they'll tell you about 30 and even 40 below zero. Now, not so much Missoula as other parts of Montana, but we had temperatures uh, a handful of temperatures below minus 20. It was pretty common to have temperatures below zero every, every winter, and typically uh, a dozen or so days below zero. Nowadays, we only get a couple of, te of night temperatures below zero. This last winter was closer to a normal winter than we've had in a couple of decades. So many people talked about how tough it was, how long the snow lasted, and all the below zero nights. That was normal in the 50s. And now it's an amazingly cold winter. And, and now we just barely, there's, I don't think we've gone a winter where we didn't go below zero at least once or twice, but only barely. I remember one winter, I think we went minus two for two nights, and that was it. That is way different than 50 years ago. So what this is showing is that conceptual graph is already proving out in Missoula. We're getting more temperatures above 95 degrees. We're getting less temperatures below zero. I, I mean, it's showing up already. And this, this analysis is about seven years old. If I did it again, I think it'd be even more extreme. The other part of our climate change that uh, I want that this new analysis just looked at then was precipitation. And this is, this is a little more complicated. What this is showing, again, um, 
oh, I have a label. It isn't degrees per 10 years. It's number of inches per 10 years. This is what happens when you use a new slide in a talk. Um, so what we're finding is most of the state over the 65 years, there's no trend. Precip isn't going up, isn't going down. It's just chattering along. In the, in the far west, us over here shows a bit of a downward trend. And out east, it shows a bit of an upward trend. But this is something we actually see uh, throughout the west, is no particular trend in precipitation. Temperatures are clearly going up, but precipitation is kind of chattering around. I want to touch quickly on um, how they do the climate projections forward, what they expect will be happening uh, here in the coming decades. And, and what they do is they use the global climate models, the GCMs, and they have to run, of course, the entire world because the atmosphere is circulating worldwide, the oceans are circulating worldwide. And so they start with a global simulation for like, let's say now to 2100. They then do what they call downscaling, where you zoom in to your local region, and you zoom in, and then you add additional things like topography uh, and, and elevation that the global models don't treat very well. And that then gives you a local look at where we think the climate is going on a more regional basis. So let's look at what the GCMs think is coming for us. This is the winter time, temperatures and precip. Throughout the Northwest, they expect, and this is for approximately to 2040, so two or three decades away. This, uh, this isn't real precise as forward models can't be, but they're imagining, this is degrees centigrade, on the order of a couple three degrees centigrade or something like five degrees Fahrenheit warmer winter temperatures in the northwest, say 30, 30 years from now. In precipitation, they actually think we may get more wintertime precipitation, which hasn't occurred yet, but this is what the climate models continue to say, uh, and the newest models continue to say this, that we may end up with more winter precipitation but it certainly is going to be warmer, uh, no doubt about that. The summertime is a bit more ominous. Now the temperature increase, June, July, August, is uh, clearly up in the four degree centigrade range, like uh, six, seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer, but they also expect less summertime rainfall. And so when you put together the combination of warmer temperatures and lower rainfall, duh, that kind of sounds like a desert, doesn't it? And so what we, what we really project is the western Montana climate slowly desertifying. And so I like to imagine, imagine the Missoula climate ending up being about like Salt Lake City in, say, 40 years. And so that's where we think our climate is going around here. Now one of the things that that does do is uh, provide a longer growing season and um, we're already seeing that. Uh, our growing season is about 10 days longer than it was 50 years ago and so if you're a gardener if you have fruit orchards uh, this is good news. It's becoming a more benign uh, climate here if you've got irrigation water is the, is the, the big secret. Uh, what this shows is a projection forward of frost-free days uh, to, 20, to the 2050s. And this is with a low emission pathway and then a business as usual high emission pathway. And as you can see, more emissions just drive warmer temperatures straight away. I want to touch on what we see as the ecosystem responses around here. Uh, and they're really about the balance of water availability and triggering disturbances are the most immediate impacts that, that we're seeing. And the first thing 
is that the snowpack's melting earlier. This was an interesting winter. We had, as we say, as, as cold and snowy a winter here in western Montana as we've had in, in decades, and yet the snowpack still started melting off by early March. And what we're seeing throughout the west is the snowpack melting on the order of a couple of weeks earlier, and we expect in 50 more years it'll continue to be a couple weeks earlier. So the dead of December, January, February, we're still going to be having a snowpack, but it's going to start a little later in November, and it's going to start ending earlier and earlier as we get into March. And so we're, we're think of it as we're kind of squeezing winter shorter and shorter and expanding summer longer and longer is kind of the summary of where our climate's going. And what this is a calculation we did for the West a few years ago, and, and it suggests that it's kind of spotty whether precipitation's going up, but potential evaporation, which is driven by higher temperatures, is going up west-wide. So we're just imagining, except for the coastal areas, all throughout the West is just going to get more and more arid over the coming decades. Now we're already seeing clear signals of this. We, we looked a few years ago at summertime stream flow. Hydrologists usually look at peak floods and annual stream flow. We wanted to see what's happening in the end of the summer when the stream flows at its lowest. And sure enough, you read all the, all the rivers we looked at and look at which every single one of these from 1950 to the present is showing low, lower and lower August stream flow. This is why they have to close the rivers to fishing in August. The, the flow rates are so low, the water temperatures are getting so high that they've just got to lay off fishing until it cools off and rains. And um, it, you didn't have to do that back in the 50s. And so when I try to look forward here uh, to say 2050 where it's five degrees or so warmer and we're getting 10% less rainfall, think of our water system as a competition between our, you might say, ecosystem and, and recreational use of water, our irrigation and farm use of water, and then our energy use of water, and we just have more demand than supply. And it's going to do nothing but get worse. Um, a good career path would certainly be hydrology, but maybe even more than hydrology would be water law, because the hydrologists already know what these trends are, but it seems like the lawyers haven't figured out how to unpack water rights in a useful way. And so this is my first kick at lawyers for the day. There'll be more. <laughs> the other thing we're already seeing is an acceleration in wildfire. And for us in, in Montana, this is, this is in effect our sea level rise. Um, we're seeing bigger fires. The season starts earlier in the summer. Uh, it goes longer into the fall. The fire, there's a, this particular study that was on the cover of Science uh, about a, uh, a decade ago uh, showed a four-time increase in number of fires, a six-time increase in uh, acreage burn, and every study just keeps seeing more and more acceleration of wildfire. And there's no reason that that's going to stop. So that's the future that we're going to have to, to deal with. So uh, fire ecology isn't a bad career choice either around here. All right, now I can't help when I give this talk that I give climate for a while and then I start, I just want to talk about what we ought to be doing, what we are doing and what we should do. So there, there's no more climate science. This is now the Anthropocene. And the first thing is just imagine what's happened to the world. Um, I was born in 1950. You know, the world population has tripled in my lifetime. Think of that, tripled in one lifetime. And I ain't dead yet either. Uh, all of our economic activities, they say it's like a six-fold increase in, in activity. And we've got to remember, the world hasn't grown one bit. And so we're on a finite planet with currently 
a, an exponential acceleration of all aspects of, of human activity, let's call it. Uh, this is the population projections planned uh, or imagined till 2050. We used to think that it, we might asymptote it around 9 billion people. We're a little over 7 now. But then there was a paper about a year ago that said now they're not so sure. We may go drift up to 11 billion people by 2100. And so you start imagining, okay, we're, uh, we're already kind of bursting at the seams. It doesn't seem like it in Montana. But I promise you, you deserve a trip to Asia, and then you come back and tell me about bursting at the seams. Oh, my God. It's interesting for about a week, and then I just explode. Um, so one of the first things that global scientists have been concerned about is global food security. And so this is a projection forward to 2050. Uh, the dotted lines for all this, maize, rice, wheat, soybean, are the projections of demand based on current consumption patterns, increasing affluence, and increasing population. And the solid lines are the expected increase in supply. And you see every one of these uh, supply is going to fall short of demand. And I could show study after study that illustrates this, that they see a global food supply uh, crunch on the way. Uh, one of the things they look at intensely, looking at the top, is the land needed to produce certain types of food. And um, you see that beef, you know, Montana's, uh, Montana's specialty, has the highest land demand of any food there is. It really is land intensive. And uh, if you just eat vegetables, you, you see where you end up down, down there. Uh, you can imagine that part of how we're going to feed the world is going to be less meat intensive. And uh, maybe not in Montana, but certainly on a worldwide basis. But the other thing that we got to remember, the food waste in the world is unbelievable. They figure on a worldwide basis, this is US, on a worldwide basis, a third of the food grown ends up not getting eaten. Eat, eated? I think I just invented a word. Uh, think of that. A third of the food grown ends up getting wasted in various ways, whether it's residential, uh, restaurants, grocery stores. I mean, it's pervasive throughout our food system. So to me, there's another career option right there. Is we got, there's no reason we can't do way better in utilizing the food that we're already growing. And I, I think that is one of those things that I would hope a number of your generation would come up with some really fine new ideas on our entire food system. And so you see, it isn't just about growing more. That's what everybody imagines. Oh, no, 9 billion people, we got to grow more food. We actually don't need to grow more food. Maybe at 11 billion, we might. But for at least the number of decades, we just have to get way smarter about what we eat and the entire system that delivers it to us. Of course, now <laughs> this one, right about the time I go to these global meetings, uh, and you'll, you'll go to one session, and they're talking about food security. And then you go over to another session, and they're talking about taking food and turning it into ethanol. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, this is literally a policy choice that humanity has and will continue to have. If we've got a bunch of corn, should we make corn ethanol or should we feed people? I mean, this is a policy choice. And one of the things I'm going to emphasize over and over is we've got all sorts of technological capacity. Right now, our ability to appropriately evaluate policy options and make choices is our problem. It's not technological capacity. So a, a number of energy, you know, there's zillions of energy economists. And they're always looking forward to see if we're going to run out of energy. So here's this is 
This came from the National Renewable Energy Lab in um, Colorado, and they imagined how we could get to renewable energy by 2050. And of course, the first thing is to wedge down um, fossil fuels, uh, coal and gas. And what they imagined is, of course, solar and wind being the big players, which are, are already developing, and this expanding wedge for biomass. Well, my lab got curious about these projections for biomass energy. And uh, I think a few of you, uh, our data sets out on the globe here out front, and we analyze global plant production every year. So we actually know more about that than anybody on Earth, I would say. Yeah. And so we thought, well, I wonder what the capacity of the Earth is for growing biomass for energy. And let's not worry about the little details of what, how we're going to do it. Let's just see what the general global capacity is. So we looked up economists and their estimates of future biomass energy. The units here are exajoules per year. And I hope all of you have had physics recently enough to remember what a joule is, but I don't. Um, just remember that it's an energy unit per year. And look at all the different estimates of biomass, biomass energy that or th these different organizations. Uh, we currently use 500 exajoules of total energy worldwide. And we were finding estimates that biomass could uh, offer 1,000 or even more exajoules per year of energy. Of course, these were by economists didn't actually know anything about how plants grow. So we got out our global data set, this is us over here, calculated what the total global growth capacity is and then how much of it you could actually harvest. Instead of 1,000 exajoules, we come to about 100 exajoules. And, we, and that's the best the planet can do. And we defy any economist to prove us wrong. And so biomass is a useful thing to look at in in uh, uh, local situations. But if we think it's just going to take over the global energy supply, that's just crazy talk, and we can prove it. And we wrote a number of papers on this uh, to document that. So one of the things we stumbled into is the idea of if you have biomass, do you want to make ethanol with it, or do you want to just make electricity with it? It's becoming more and more clear that ethanol is not the thing to do. And in fact, piston engines are not the thing to do. I hope you never buy another piston engine car in your lifetime. Because the, the energy efficiency of a piston engine is awful. And if you think I'm exaggerating, next time you're in your car, turn the heater on full blast as you drive around. And imagine all of that is waste heat just pouring out of your engine, and of course the front of the engine is pouring more out. Simply taking a, a, a normal car and, and turning it into electricity instead of uh, biomass at least doubles the efficiency of that car. And I can prove it. I brought a Prius Prime a month ago, and I currently am averaging 140 miles per gallon equivalent with that car. And so this isn't hypothetical at all. Uh, running on electric power is at least double the efficiency of gas power. So let's talk some more about energy. And let me see how I'm doing. Yep, I better keep going. This is the track of carbon emissions worldwide since 1990. And you so since 1990, uh, emissions have gone up. Every year, the economic collapse helped for one year. But it's getting interesting now. For two years now, we think global carbon emissions are showing signs we might be leveling off. And so, I mean, we're desperate for any good news we can find. <laughs> and we think that maybe we're on the cusp of at least leveling off carbon emissions. Now, where do they come from? Um, European Union, U.S., China. 
And of course, the long history was the US and the EU, and it's only been the last decade that China has shot past all of us. Um, you might notice that both the EU and the US peaked in carbon emissions probably six, eight years ago. So we already have peaked. And for all the bad news we have, there, there's hard statistics that US and the EU are turning the corner in carbon emissions. And, and so we, uh, uh, in fact, what's funny is we're on track to meet our Paris Accord target as is. So what a stupid thing to step out of that when we're going to meet it. Don't get me started on that. Oh, boy. That'll go forever. We also know where it comes from. And uh, the big spike you see was coal burning in China you know, over the last decade. Oil continues to drift up and gas drift up. The big spike was coal. The now, what we try to understand in um, global carbon cycle science is where this is going. Uh, we have the sources of carbon emissions, which does include deforestation and things like wildfires and agricultural burning. And about 44% of it goes in the atmosphere, and you see it in that Keeling curve of atmospheric CO2. The other two, the land biosphere absorbs about 30% of it, and the ocean absorbs about 26% of it. So what in my work, what we're trying to understand is how to make this sink bigger. As we slow down emissions, if we could get the biosphere to absorb more, then that would get us ahead. But with emissions, there have been a number of studies now that illustrate quite clearly just simple mass balances that if, if we really do, and we being the global nation, the, the Paris Accord Agreement to be exact, if we are going to meet the Paris Accord Agreement worldwide, half the known oil reserves and 80% of the coal reserves can't ever be dug. So they, they ought to quit looking for oil right now because we're not, we're not even going to, we better not even use what we already know. Uh, have, have under reserves, and uh, certainly with coal. And in fact, I can't summarize it more distinctly that if society worldwide doesn't quit burning coal, nothing else matters. I might as well uh, just uh, uh, push my Prius Prime into the Clark Fork and find a used Hummer and drive around if we're going to keep burning coal. I mean, coal, you saw two slides ago, is such a dominating force of carbon emissions that it's clearly the first thing for humanity to quit doing. And it's a public health menace on top of being a climate menace. And so uh, it, it certainly is, is the first thing that we need to do, and it's happening. This is a quote uh, straight out of an uh, oilprice.com website from a couple of months ago, the decline of coal industry is long-term and irreversible. So we are seeing the corner turned on coal burning worldwide already, and that includes climate in, uh, China and India in addition. And so this is another bit of good news that we see coming along. But on the other hand, then there's the natural gas and uh, flaring. You know when they were opening up the Bakken oil fields, they were flaring a hundred million dollars of gas a month. They didn't want to bother collecting and processing it, so they just lit it and squirted it into the air. And we let them do it. I think we're fools to let them do it. There's just no excuse for that. They don't have to pay royalties on this. They just got it out of the way so they could get the oil. And this is, to me, just a natural resource disaster on top of being a climate disaster. And so we have policy, energy policy issues left and right that need work. Um, this is a good example of part of it. This is just a look at various tax um, subsidies that different industries have. And all I want you to do is notice how big the fossil fuel tax 
subsidy wedge is compared to the renewable tax wedge. Fossil fuels aren't cheap if they had to pay full sticker price, but they get uh, they have for decades built in endless tax and subsidy advantages, and uh, the renewable energy could compete easily toe to toe in a genuine capital capitalist economy if it was a fair playing field. So um, uh, anybody that wants to become a corporate tax lawyer on the good side, uh, there's lots of room for that. Now one of the things that I have really watched intently in the last five years, three years, is how our big tech titans, let's call them, are starting to lead and lead with their own money. This wasn't happening five years ago. They were kind of sitting quietly. I think they were doing things quietly. And now they realize, and of course in the last few months they doubly realize, they have to openly and publicly lead. And they're doing it, and they're doing it with their checkbooks. And this is really something new, and something that I hope will bring momentum that your generation can really ride. And of course, China is, we're just handing global leadership to China right now. Here's the football, China. Have a good time leading the world. We're kind of tired of it. That's literally what our president is doing, is handing leadership of the world to China. And trying to resurrect coal jobs when here's where the job growth is. Uh, the, solar, the solar employment acceleration is quite spectacular. The wind power uh, employment acceleration is equally uh, exponential. And so the places where clearly the economy is pointing us to um, have, have jobs uh, ready to go. And a lot of things are controlled, a lot of this policy is controlled by the public service commissions of each state. And I'll bet most of you don't even know what a PSC is. But they control energy policy in every state and we need to spend way more time uh, uh, putting heat on our public service commissions. One of the things we could do, nobody seem, wants to build new dams, but you know almost all of our big dams were built 60, 70, 80 years ago. That's what my dad did, was built big concrete dams. The electric power generators in those dams are decades and decades obsolete. So without building any new dams, we could upgrade the power generation in these old dams and double their output. This has been illustrated a number of times. And so you start seeing a world where there is, rather than these huge power plants like coal strip or like a nuclear plant or even like a big hydropower plant, we're going to have millions of small power uh, production. Uh, uh, rooftop solar is, of course, just right around town here. You see. Uh, solar panels and um, uh, wind turbines. You go, you drive from here to Portland and you drive through hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines. Um, and so we see a future that's way different than these small, than these, uh, the, than these gigantic singular power plants like we had in the future. Now there's going to be electric power being generated all over the place, including our own houses. And as we get transportation electrified, uh, I plug in my new car, and uh, the next morning it's juiced up, ready to go. And uh, around Missoula, the gas engine never turns on. And uh, you can imagine this is technology that's already arrived. And we don't have to invent anything new that isn't already on the market. And you start seeing that the cost reductions in all, of all these components have now reached a point where this is a very viable technology. Um, I'm watching the autonomous car world with curiosity because part of what I, I'm seeing is that the younger generation is much less enamored with owning their own car than ours was. When I was a kid, you dreamed of the day you're 16 
to get your driver's license, and then the day you're 16 and a half to get your own car. And you would go get a job simply to support your car. What a, when I think of how stupid was that? You're working to support this car that you wouldn't need if you didn't have the job. Well, your generation's already clearly smarter on this. I saw a statistic that about a quarter of 20, what was it, 20 to 25 year olds don't even bother to have a driver's license. They don't even bother to have a driver's license. That's how disinterested they are in car ownership. And so I'm watching this idea of autonomous cars uh, quite closely because that would change urban transport in a massive way. The number of parking lots we have could be cut in half. Uh, this was an analysis of automated mobility in towns all over the country. And it's tens of billions of dollars of uh, opportunity for building the systems for this kind of automated mobility. Uh, clearly different than my generation. And it, it means city planning is going to get way different. Uh, when I'm on my bike, uh, I'm uh, kind of a small handful, not in Missoula so much, but uh, in other places, and yet uh, that uh, becomes more and more viable. The, either the less cars there are, or the more you have infrastructure. These are pictures of Vienna, where they have bridges just for the bikes. Well, we have some bridges just for bikes and walking now, too. My favorite are these new electric assist bikes. I am not getting any younger. And you have a tiny little electric motor. And some little white-haired grandma, I was going up Rattlesnake towards my house just a couple weeks ago. And I have to watch how I say this. She was a kind of elderly looking woman. And she went by me like I was standing still. And I look up and I go, what? And then I kind of watch. She sure wasn't pushing very hard. And I think she's nabbed herself an electric bike. Do you know autonomous trucks are already on the way? There's going to be convoys of driverless trucks that will drive down the freeway and uh, just stay over in the right-hand lane. You could deploy them in the middle of the night and make them park during the day. And so these are the sort of things that I see coming. This is a test in Germany last year. Uh, of course, home efficiency, we already have tremendously good capability with new houses in energy efficiency. We don't really need to, to uh, invent anything new. What I do think we got to do better on is recycling. Um, the recycling of our electronics is abysmal, even something like tires. You know, they haven't really found anything very good to do with tires. Think how many billions of tires are generated every year that I, they pile up like that and then they light on fire. So this is what we're looking at. This is a look at global at, at emissions uh, from now till the end of the century. And here we are down here. And this mess is the climate models trying to figure out what's going to happen. Are we going to keep shooting up like business as usual, as they call it, uh, to the end of the century and, and have um, a good five, six, seven degree warmer Earth to contend with? Are we going to get smart quick, uh, which doesn't look too likely now, and drill down our emissions rapidly and everything in between? And the, and the the spectrum here is not model uncertainty. It's social uncertainty. It's what, are, what is huma humanity going to decide to do? And so I find a lot of it gets back to what I call that great acceleration of growth in human activity. And this is a slide a friend of mine put together. And if you look at every one of these, from water use to marine fish catch to tropical forest loss to methane emission, everything, you're just seeing every one of these curves just go up exponentially over the last half a century. And you can't help but figure this can't keep going on. It just can't keep going on on a finite planet. And uh, um, one of the finest philosophers of my generation, Edward Abbey, 
Uh, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. And so what I see is we actually need less climate scientists and we need more economists that think about low growth economics. And so uh, using gross domestic product measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. That was Robert Kennedy's quote 30 years ago. We've got to get better economists that have a realistic understanding of, of the world that we live in and the capacities of this world. Because right now, all economists think about is growth. Every, you uh, watch the news every single day, and whenever they interview an economist, the first thing they show is we, uh, we're growing this much, and we've got to grow faster. And they just uh, irrationally just want economic growth uh, at all costs. And so I would hope a few of you would become astute economists, not these uh, uh, robots. Uh, one plug here for U of M, we have a climate change minor that you can major in anything from philosophy to uh, uh, physics and take climate change as a minor and go through all the stuff I've been talking about. Um, I find that this cartoon is a great summary of the whole issue. Uh, all these different things that we could work on, uh, better public health, clean water, renewables, livable cities. What if it's a big hoax and we're doing it all for nothing? And I, I, I guess uh, I first did this uh, essay about 10 years ago, and I find that it almost needs to be recycled, this five stages of climate grief. Uh, when I look at public response to this issue, I find all these different, uh, you might say, categories of response. And it, it comes back to uh, these five stages of grief that this uh, psychologist came up with decades ago. Everything from denial. Do we not have denial going on right now? Um, anger, yeah. Uh, bargaining. Depression, where I spend most of my life. And uh, then finally, simple acceptance. This is the world we're in, and let's get to work. And I really hope your, uh, this student generation uh, stays firmly in step five and just gets to work, because that's really what the world needs. So that's it for me. Thanks.